All right, welcome everybody to another edition of 1920 Negro National League uh, special uh, event here today. Where I'm here with uh, Pete Gordon of the Donaldson Network. We're going to do some barnstorming and talk a little bit of Negro League baseball history and lots of other things. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to put Pete on here so a second so we can see uh, him as well. There you are. Hey, hey. Hey, let's get on the road. All right. I, I, as soon as I saw Pete earlier, you know, he, he's got – you got to show him that Donaldson jersey. That, that's, this is uh, the 1932 John Donaldson's All-Stars. That is awesome. <laughs> right? Love it. Love it. Quick quick story. Tell him about what, what how you got that real quick. Just so, uh, the Donaldson cool. Network is a group of people who have uh, put together a bunch of historians. We're probably about 700 or so people who have – contributed to our effort trying to find John Donaldson games. He know, he's known to have played in 744 different cities at this time. Uh, that number continues to rise. Um, one of those places was Vernon, California. Uh, I sent a nice letter to a guy once several years ago. Um, we needed a game that John Donaldson pitched in Vernon, California. Well, he was a uniform maker. Um, and so I s happened to slide in a picture of John Donaldson's All-Stars. Uh, so he could get a good look at the uniform. And uh, I told him I needed a box score from a game that John Donaldson played there. And could you go by the local newspaper office or library and uh, find this game? And he did. And a couple months later, um, three different John Donaldson's All-Stars uniforms came in the mail, along with the box score of a John Donaldson win um, when he played out in California in the California Winter League with the Los Angeles White Sox. So people are always contributing to our effort. This was one way that the guy could contribute to it. Um, and we're very grateful for that. Awesome. I think it's very, very cool. I uh, love the hat too, as well. I got to, I got to get me, I have a, I have a, in a box, a whole bunch of other things that, um, as I've been doing this, I've been pulling them out. I got my hats. I've got my card sets. I've got, and I've got a uh, Casey Monarchs jersey that I got to find. <laughs> that, yeah. you know, sometimes things just get put away, you know. And you gotta... right. I was in a, um, <laughs> I was at an auction once with Franco Harris, the great Pittsburgh running back, um, and he was at a, a Negro League conference, and he was a guest there. And uh, I was in the elevator with him after he had just won the Buck O'Neill um, jersey. It was. Uh, I don't know, silent auction, something. Uh, so I was in the elevator with the great Franco Harris. And I said to Franco, you, look, man, you can go put this on a wall in a frame and put it in your pool room or whatever. And uh, no one will ever see it, but you should really wear it around because that shows that you uh, know not only and, and respect and understand what the Negro leaguers were. Um, and Franco Harris looked at me kind of funny and he was like, like he was going after that football on the, uh, <laughs> unbelievable catch that he made and uh, and i said you should do that because that would be good for all of our efforts to be able to tell who these guys are and he smiled and he looked at me and he goes you know what i'm gonna wear it because he said the first thought was it was going to go in the closet and go along with all uh, awesome. the hundreds of other jerseys that franco harris you might imagine franco harris's closet would look like um but it's important that we wear these things around so people can realize yeah. I, I went and got I went and got my vaccine shot the other day, and I took my bu took Buck O'Neill with me with on my uh, my Buck O'Neill shirt and my uh, something Cuban you can roll up, right? My yeah, my Cuban X Giants hat, and you know what? Sure enough, people were there, and they asked, "Who's that?" And I got to tell well, them, right. and it was fun. I mean, I I just think it that's that's what makes this. Um, so much fun on top of like hopefully educating people with a lot you know on what's going on it's funny yeah, you said about frank funny you said about franco harris though right i mean he, he's a penn stater i'm, I'm a penn stater uh yeah. myself and he's a you know legendary at penn state so i may have to reach out to uh the penn state alumni and see if we get franco harris to talk franco to harris who yeah no, see, if he, that, see right? if he's still see if he's still got his uh, uh his jersey i bet you he does i'm sure he does i'm he, sure that he i'm certain that he <laughs> And they, he probably remembers when he was sort of assaulted by the guy in the elevator. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sure. I bet you will. <laughs> so, so what we're going to do here is something a little different. I'm, I'm at the end of this, at the very, very tail end. I'm going to do another week of the of the National League Negro National League 1920 season just to move it along closer to the draft day because I want to I want to get to that draft and get as we talked about 
earlier, I've got some names in there like Neil Suttles and Cool Papa Bell and, and so many others that I, I want to see, you know, get them into this into this simulation as well because they're coming in as young 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 players for the draft. But <clears throat> but before we do that, we're going to do something that uh, I think is going to be a lot of fun. I, as we've talked about, you can elaborate on this a little bit, but barnstorming was the Negro Leagues, uh, and, and we're going to do a 1920s, uh, an actual matchup of the – Casey Stengel All-Stars, uh, which was made up of several teams from several players uh, uh, and some yeah. some notable names versus the Kansas City Monarchs, which was played in, on what date? It was in October, I'm assuming, right? Yes, October of 1920. All right. So, 10th, so October 10th. So, And I'm going to show everybody, too, as well, so the people in, in, in the Out of the Park uh, you know, world can see how I set this up because, um, you know, the thing I've, I've mentioned to you and we've talked about is to me, the Negro leagues are the ultimate what if, right? Because they didn't get the opportunity and, and you, you and so many others are trying to tell the story. And, and I've, I've had on Sean Gibson, uh, who talked about the legacy and what the foundation of the uh, Gibson foundation is doing, uh, that was great to hear that perspective. And I've had on Kevin L. Mitchell and Todd Peterson. In the future, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Brunson, James Brunson on, uh, and, and many, many others. Scott Simkus from Seam Heads. Um, who else? Phil S. Dixon in two days. I'm going to have as many authors, historians, researchers, uh, photographers, uh, card art uh if anybody artists like Greg Kreindler who did the Negro Leagues uh, card set and just to sure. talk about why they got into it what what made them you know and it's just just a lot of fun and try to spread the word so uh, yeah so so I, I want to walk just through that process of how I set up and out of the park this whole process because I've set up a whole entire 1920 barnstorming circuit that's going to have um, not just uh, you know, the Negro League teams, but who they played against. So we'll have this Casey thing of All-Stars. We'll have the Beloit yeah. Leaguers. We'll have several others, Kansas City Blues, minor league team, and so forth. So it should be should be fun. Well, let me tell you a little bit about barnstorming quickly. Yes, Because yes. people are, I don't maybe know what that is or why that's important or, or really how foreign it is a concept when you talk about league play every single day um, as we have it today. Um Barnstorming was a necessity for Negro League teams because it was an opportunity to make money outside of their league or that's where they came from because um, independent black baseball teams would travel all around Barnstorm um, before the league even happened in 1920. There were several other leagues attempted before that, but in general, what you had was the Kansas City Monarchs. You had one stadium in Kansas City to play at. Um, it was controlled by the Kansas City Blues, the minor league team. Uh, by the time April came out and there was a schedule made up of how many dates there were going to be at uh, the stadium association park or Mulebach stadium or wherever it was in Kansas city. Um, the minor league team took all the dates and then the Negro league teams would have to come in afterwards and decide which dates they wanted to have. Um, it was completely afterwards. And so it was all done in a real hurried fashion at the end of the spring when the Negro League teams, the only time they could have an opportunity to know what their schedule was going to be was relatively short period of time. It wasn't like it was printed the year before, mm -hmm. and then everybody bought their tickets for the 4th of July a year right. in advance. Um, that's just not the way it was. And so they were constantly playing behind because they had... Uh, they didn't really know what those dates were going to be, which necessitated this need for barnstorming and something that they always did. And league games in the 1920 Negro National League season were played uh, between Thursday and Sunday, giving you the rest of the week to be able to do something else, travel between places and necessitated barnstorming. You could pick up a little extra cash. People would uh, and you could build your brand and your name recognition and Players like John Donaldson uh, took a huge advantage of this because he was famous in places where they didn't have major leagues. Um, and so John Donaldson's name and reputation was much built on barnstorming because that's what he could do in the 19 teens, mm -hmm. 1910s, when that was the only thing they could really do. And so John Donaldson and barnstorming becomes a part of black baseball history because those guys are always stopping at a town in between uh, the um, Negro League cities, um, stopping at many different towns in between to play almost anywhere, anytime, um, in any conditions, uh, right. to pick up extra money for their ball clubs. And you know, um, 
I think it, it's such an overlooked, uh, not just about the Negro Leagues, but such an overlooked aspect to the building of the brand, like you just said. M- Major League Baseball benefited, I think, uh, from the barnstorming that the Negro Leagues did because, you know, this was before television. This was before radio in most places. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, most places in the United States in 1920 and, and, and uh, you know, all the way, of, you know, probably World War II and maybe in some places beyond – they, they were inaccessible to people to go to see a major league game. Uh, if you were in, 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 in some of these places, you just couldn't travel like you can today. I mean, I literally can drive a couple of hours and I could go see uh, a half a dozen or more significant level minor league teams. I can go see the Texas Rangers, Houston Astros. I could, I, it's not even that far, even if I wanted to drive to some other places, right? So uh, when I was in Pennsylvania, it was even better because I was a couple of hours from Boston, New York, anyway, yeah. Pittsburgh, mm-hmm. everywhere, right? I mean, so that's, that's you know, what wasn't there. So baseball's brand was built by these teams traveling and they never got to see a major league or that caliber of team. So what bothers me, and as we've talked about with these barnstorming is people take that aspect of it and they say, well, the Negro leagues only played against the local firehouse team. Uh Well, they did, but the significance of that is out of context to these. Totally. Yeah. And so, well, John Donaldson brought major league quality to places where there were no major leagues. Yeah. And they wanted, so a lot of people tell me, you know, John Donaldson would be, a much better Hall of Fame candidate if he had played against more major leaguers. Well, the places where John Donaldson was, there were no major leaguers. No, there not, were never not, going not to be any major leaguers. for five hundred miles, probably. Right, right, <laughs> right. right. And it wasn't like there was a, a major leaguer, you know, hiding behind the hay bales <laughs> right. in the middle of Nebraska somewhere. Right. I mean, that just wasn't. I mean, that's illogical. Yes. Um, and, but it's a, a place where many people go to in terms of a line of logic to try and explain or not explain the significance of ne- Negro leaguers or not have to take the um, the significant step to be able to actually have some facts and knowledge of the situation. Right. What's been passed down to you and handed down and really cookie cuttered for us um, isn't the whole story. No. And the other thing, too, that dawned on me the other day when I was I was just doing a little bit of digging was, uh, you know, obviously now Jackie Robinson comes along. The color line is 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 gone. And now all of these players are a, a pipeline into the major leagues. And that became uh, faster and faster as, as the years went by and more and more players came in, which at so, you know, to me, baseball is the ultimate cause and effect game. Right. And so if the cause of the Negro leaguers going into the major leagues, the effect of that was now obviously the talent in the Negro leagues is going down. So what ended up happening, right? Um, and, and you could probably touch on this better than I can, because I, I don't really know a lot about it, but I do remember these teams as a kid, the Negro leagues. Now they resorted in some cases to barns, this barnstorming circuit with gimmicks and teams who, who sure. sometimes were uh, more show than they were. Uh, the baseball was good. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, we've all seen the film of Goose Curry, you know, slapping around sure. at first base and they had the Zulu cannibal, you know, giants and crazy teams. Right. And, and that's another misconception. Now, you know, people who may have remembered some of these Negro league teams now have that in their brain, sure. that somehow it was just like a joke, a uh, vaudeville act. And, and it, 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 wasn't you know it became that to some degree and it's disappointing that I, i've talked to a lot of people who that's how they viewed it well i mean i it's also important to understand that the, um baseball thrived because these major league quality players were coming to places where there weren't any major leaguers but they also sustained the town's ability to be able to have baseball in their town yeah. uh, and many Many teams still, even to this day, operate themselves into the red, right? They're in the negative. End of the year comes around, they pass the hat around. There's just not enough money to be able to sustain baseball, to pay the umpires and all the things that are associated with baseball games. But when John Donaldson would come to your town, uh, you could be operating in the red, and then you'd end up with a huge profit. And then you were able to sustain baseball for another year in your town because, like the wind, it changed every day. 
And so that was um, a really a part of what John Donaldson's legacy needs to be mm-hmm. is he sustained baseball in places where baseball wasn't going to survive because John Donaldson, the famous John Donaldson would come to their town and then baseball in general benefited from that. That's right. Uh, I'm going to throw up uh, while, while we're talking about this, I'm just going to put up uh, your brave host website. Cause I want people, yeah. I want people to, uh, to be able to see. Well, John Donaldson.bravehost.com is our webpage. And what we decided uh, many, many years ago was that there needed to be a place on the web that had everything that had John Donaldson related to it. And so we, we went out to, and designed to build it that way. Um, you could go to your, you know, find yourself a sixth grader right now and you can figure out what Lou Gehrig did on a Tuesday night in uh, August of 1926 within 15 seconds um, right on your phone. That was never something you could do for Negro League baseball players. We needed to start establishing a web presence so that when I said John Donaldson and you went, yeah, I know who that is. And then you look real quick on your Google and you figure out who that was. Um, that was needed to be able to happen. So we built John Donaldson.bravehost.com to be able to accomplish that and what that is access is a repository for all of the different parts of our um, effort that we're working on our youtube channel link is there uh, our missing games page is there uh, we tell you the things we don't know in trying to find more people more volunteers to help us fill in, in calendars for john Dallas's career and to this date we've come up with 419 wins 5,164 strikeouts, the most more wins and more strikeouts than any segregated player in the history of the game. And John Donaldson.bravos.com does that. And you can see this is also the what you're seeing now is Negro Leagues.bravos.com. My website guy uh, said, Well, there's all these other things that don't have John Donaldson listed on them. Um, what else can we do with this stuff and put that stuff up so people can resources for people to look at as well. Yeah. Um, and so they made Negro leagues.bravehost.com, which puts all different um, seasons and shows a bunch of data that has been collected oh, in search of John Donaldson initially, but mostly it was extra that came about after John Donaldson searches. It's, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, and it's things back here to go back to 1911 and, and, teams yeah. like the 1911 mobile mobile dixie stars and the 10th cavalry troop b team and and yeah. it's just i mean it's fascinating I, it, it really really is I, it's so I just, big it's so it is such a oh big thing and, and, and we sat and we thought about it for months and months about how we're going to do this and how it's going to be represented because you're talking about a huge sky of stars and you're trying to figure out who these yes. guys are um and the only way that you could really at the time the only way that we could really do that was to start creating a wikipedia pages for these people and so how do you do that well they need to have firsthand references and so all of these references um, were collected and whenever they mentioned mule subtles or any other um, negro league baseball player we put that and linked it back to their web page because you need a firsthand source yep now <clears throat> why why i wanted to throw this up there is another illustration of, of... You know what? What I try to put out on Twitter just about every day is uh, some some little tidbit, just like you do with John Donaldson, just some little tidbit. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about the Negro Leagues is there's probably not a spot in the country from Maine to Oregon and everywhere in between that didn't have either a team or a team came through or players are from there, and and so it touched everywhere. And when you look at all of these. Uh, teams that you have listed here and i'm sure there's many many more uh it it was everywhere and and i think if people just took a second to uh you know to explore their local history they're going to find it uh somewhere i mean it, it's it's fascinating no stuff it. it's fascinating well that was what what started my effort or our effort to do the john donaldson was a guy was putting a, a book together about black baseball in minnesota and as he was shopping it around to people they go well that's going to be really short um, cause there's, you know, historically hasn't been a, a large African-American population in the state of Minnesota. Well, the, the fact is, is there's a hidden history there or was, um, and we're changing that every single day. John Donaldson played in 133 cities in Minnesota alone. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> I, I don't think I, 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 I challenge any historian or anybody to try and find a baseball player who played in more cities in Minnesota than John Donaldson did. Um, I don't yeah. think in the history of the game there is. And because of the way society was and because of what 
the, where we were at those times um, that caused him to be able to play in so many places where even greats like Paul Molitor and Dave Winfield, I mean, good luck. Those guys grew up here and played here a lot, mm -hmm. but they certainly didn't play in anywhere near 130 cities in the state of Minnesota. And so people think, well, that was going to be a real short book. Well, we obviously shown people things that are, they just don't believe from the outset. Yeah. You've got some great, I just put up the John Donaldson, Site, yeah, there it is. And it's just, it's just, uh, you can get on here and you can get, if people check this, these things out, you can get uh, lost. I think <laughs> that it, what's relevant so about much, this. There's so much cool stuff to look at. There, it, There is a lot of information. And believe me, we get lots of comments about how boring it is. And maybe oh, I don't think it's, really I don't think it's it, boring at all. <laughs> maybe we should make it more graphic interface and make it really cool. But the, the fact is, is it has a lot of information in there. There's a lot of information to look at. But this isn't me telling you to do that. This isn't me telling you John Donaldson's great. Go look for yourself. It's yeah. right there. Um, yeah. There certainly it's it's voluminous in terms of there's 419 wins in there. Um, there's all kinds of calendars and research dates and all these different information in there. But it's all out there, mm -hmm. and so we're able to show you everything that we have. Um, so we're trying to fill in this calendar to somewhere there's a tune of 2,500 games he has on there now. Yeah. Um, it's important for us to be able to be um, transparent and show people everything that we have. Yeah, and I think, it, like I said, I don't, I don't think it's boring at all. I think it's fascinating. It's just well, not a, only do we show you everything we have, we tell you everything we don't have. And yeah. so that's an interesting thing, too, yeah. because find me another historian who's going to just show you every, right. tell you so, everything I don't know. So there you go, right? Uh, there's a great there's a great thing to, to mention, too, is um, kind of along what I'm saying. If you were in, if you have something in your town and it adds to the story, let let you guys know right if people yeah. out there uh, this is this is a gra kind of grassroots right <laughs> oh kind of it, it's the definition of it yeah um john donaldson in, in all the places the 20 31 states and provinces that he played in look i, I do this all elevator game all the time where where are you from well john yep. donaldson played there um and that's important for people to realize that we have access to all those things and it it, it opens up another layer for other people, I've mm -hmm. had people call me and say, my grandpa played in this game and I Google searched his name and it came up on your web page and he played with John Donaldson. Cool. Oh, really? I mean, this it's is fun stuff. Yeah, this is what we were working on and this is what we're trying to change every day. Fun stuff. So Thursday, Thursday night, I'm going to have on uh, Phil S. Dixon and he, he reminds me uh, of like the modern day barnstormer i mean he he went on a tour a couple of years ago right where he went around the entire country to two three hundred cities that had some some connection to the negro leagues and talked about it and i just thought it was great it just it just to me was like a modern day barnstorming tour uh that uh, i gotta give him credit I, we're gonna talk about that when we uh talk to him uh on thursday night but uh, you know what what everybody is doing is just um I just think it's important and I'm just trying to get you guys um, in front of some more people. So that's absolutely yeah. great. I mean, I think the importance, one of the important things that we got to talk about is that society did a really good job of not letting us remember who John Donaldson was. Mm -hmm. And that was a part of what our shared past is. Um, we're changing that every single day. We're redoing his legacy so people can into the future can know and be educated enough to know that John Donaldson was one of the greatest baseball players in the history of our sport. Mm -hmm. And people need to understand why and how that is. And it's a lot of information because the, the game is about a lot of information, but what John Donaldson was able to do in his 33 year career from 1908 to 1940, and then after that, he becomes the first black scout in, in major league baseball history with the Chicago white Sox. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things is culmination of John Donaldson, who was our problem. And we're solving that every single day. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, I mean, a great effort. It's fascinating. I, I, I run, run into people who just don't know any of this and, and, and they might have a little bit, or they might have a preconceived notion. And I think every day just to, just to get that information out there and in front of people is just really a lot. Uh, I think it's, it's, gonna, a, it's, a, it's an well. endeavor for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's something that needs to be focused. And we've worked on this and very so hard. Many, so many wow. people out there doing it. And, and I think more and more are getting involved in it and starting to understand. And it, I think it's, it's awesome. I mean, um, anyway, uh, we'll, uh, you have uh, to, at the core of it though, you must, 
you must understand that John Donaldson's legacy is worth that. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's I, what we are. It is worth it. And there's, and I have a we we built a model over 20 years. I'm on my 21st year uh, of working on this every day. Uh, John Donaldson is something that is worth it and valued enough for us to know and talk about today. He didn't just die and go away. Right. He helped shape where we are today. And exactly. he's remembered exactly for doing that. As did, as did all of these players and teams and owners and, and significant achievements that go back, you know, 150 years almost um, of, of these players that just got lost and trampled on and misconstrued and, and not uh, given any, uh, of, of you know maybe the due that they that they deserve and I think it's just awesome you know I, I, I hardly wait to you know keep on keep on doing this and keep getting you out there we, you you can come back you know we do this every day I don't care don't I mean, look I think, out yeah, I think this is like, oh, we don't need that guy anymore <laughs> yeah no no right, no right, I think right. no I think it's awesome so I'm gonna um, uh, anything anything else you want to add before I, I jump on into our uh, into our well I mean uh, I think it's important to talk about um, change and our world has seen a lot of change in the last few years and maybe in the last few months and, and uh, as people we, want to be a part of this change uh, recognizing african-american legacies and how they are an indelible part of our history is important um, not only because it actually did happen and we need to establish that it did happen or and not only that did our grandfathers and their grandfathers not tell us about these people um it's we need to realize today that once we know better which we do um we need to be able to tell people in as many ways possible mm -hmm. that what their version of how they understood Negro League Baseball has so much more to it than what uh, has traditionally been handed down to us. That's right. And you know, one thing I just want, I hope everybody is, is clear on this and, and because it, it's something that does kind of bother me. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not, I'm a come lately to this type of thing, but I mean, I have been a long time Negro League. Uh, I, I don't want to say historian because I'm not, I mean, I just, just doing my, my, background reading and researching and my own little projects and writing that, you know, many people have, have not seen many people I know have, but anyway, um, one of the things that, that, uh, I just hope people are clear on, no one is trying to mythologize any of this. I mean, th this, this, this is facts. These are, uh, accounts of the day. These are clippings. These are any, any fact that's there. This isn't like trying to recreate something that wasn't. And, and, and I, I just hope people understand that because, um, you know, that's, that's some of the misinformation that you run, that I, I run into. I'm sure you do all the time, oh, that, okay. you know, Oh no, they were, they were minor league players. They were not this, they were not that. No, no, no. I mean, I, as we talked about, these guys didn't spring out of the earth in 1947 and become MVPs of their leagues and, and, you know, change the way the game was played. They were doing it already and they were doing it because they were forced to. That's, that's kind of the that's thing right. that, that really people need to understand this some people I've talked to and I, and, and it's, it really, I just can't understand this, this, this mindset is, is the minor league mindset, right. And that they were playing against the farm, you know, the local firehouse team and the local mm -hmm. Legion team. Yes, that's true, but they weren't playing there against those teams and barnstorming and in their own league because they weren't good enough to play in major league baseball. They couldn't play in Major League Baseball. And they couldn't not only play in Major League Baseball, they couldn't play in Minor League Baseball either. And this was all not their choice. And if given the choice and given the opportunity, guarantee 20% or more of those players would have been in the majors and then all the way down. <laughs> a huge what if, though. I mean, I don't know that it, I don't know that you could – no, exactly. I'll prematurely say twenty percent. No, it, it's it's kind of a thumb in the air kind of thing. But right. no, but that's right. Just but looking what, at it what from the, a, what the what the major leagues lost, small town America gained. Yeah, that's um, true. You're right. And 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 that doesn't devalue the small town Americans as human beings, um, as opposed to going to the polo grounds like they're the only people that matter. Um, in the major leagues, look, these guys didn't have John Donaldson had no aspiration to play in the major leagues. Why would he have mm -hmm. um, any more than I have to walk on the moon? Sure, I'd love to do that, and maybe we're getting closer to that. But uh, 
that just wasn't something that he was biting his nails, riding on a train car mm-hmm. from small town to small town, thinking waiting for John McGraw to call him. <laughs> waiting for uh, John McGraw to send him a telegram or whatever the case. Well, was. I mean, the, the the fact is, is that he did do that, but the, they had the opportunity was not there, and to 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 say in a modern concept or context that. Uh, all these guys had major league aspirations is absolutely false. That's just not something that was possible. Right. You're not going to, it, it just wasn't, that's a, that's a modern application of, mm-hmm. of what we think of today. And, and look, you talk about free agent, you talk about um, Jackie Robinson, 1947 and the eventual gradual uh, integration of major league baseball. There weren't, it wasn't free agency. Mm-hmm. Um, Jackie Robinson didn't just sign with whoever he wanted to. Mm-hmm. They had a whole system of the reserve clause and how to get into that. It wasn't like today where if somebody um, from a, uh, let's just say, a, 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 a Eastern European city comes up and is a great baseball player, Sid Finch comes and throws <laughs> 200 miles an hour, right? He can just walk into the Minnesota Twins clubhouse and start burning them up at 200 miles an hour. No, that wasn't that wasn't possible. Mm-hmm. There were safeguards for the industry put in place so that made that mm-hmm. impossible to do. It is only after the 1970s and free agency that we get this idea that it is possible for people to just sign with whomever they want. That wasn't something that was available and ultimately hindered and slowed the integration of major league baseball because that's the way it was and mm-hmm. that's a um, hard thing for people to understand today you kind of assume that if philip is just yeah. out of nowhere yep. comes up with a 200 mile an hour fastball that someone could catch uh, he can go play for the texas rangers mm-hmm. that's not true mm-hmm. and that's not even possible it's fantasy land no i, I agree uh, but you know just so everybody's clear right um this bar- the barnstorming the leagues that they were playing in and there were more than the negro national league in 1920 there were others being formed at the same time there were attempts to do it prior um wasn't because they weren't good enough to play in the majors uh, i think that you know most people who who understand the game and and, and the accounts of, of of real major league players i mean many major league players ted williams's speech at the hall of fame uh you know uh induction um you know they knew how good these players were and, and because of this, you know, social, uh, you know, curtain that they were behind, they, they, they couldn't play. And, and I just, oh. I just trying to dispel that myth that they were not That's good right. enough. They just, were playing there because they weren't good enough. Just assume that Philip is good enough and it's 1920 yeah. and Philip lives in Argentina. Um, it isn't easy to get to the United States of America to play the national pastime yeah. uh, because of traveling. I mean, yeah. it isn't like it is today. Um, there's no way you're going to teleport yourself from Argentina to here to play in the major leagues. I mean, that just isn't possible. And to think that it was really short changes the people who actually were here, mm-hmm. um, who actually oh. did endure what they did endure. And John Donaldson is one of those guys front and center. I mean, to, 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 to put yourself in that context, uh, that time period, that you know, from day to day, these guys were doing this because this was their living. So like you pointed out, right, barnstorming, and, and this is how they were able to make a little bit of extra money. And, and in that barnstorming world, you had the, like you pointed out already, you had the team owner, you had the, the booking agent, you had the stadium owner, you had the other team, you had your own team. Who who was getting a cut of all of this? There's only so much of the pie, right? So, so you, uh, but they were, you know, you, you did it. And, and then put the racial social context on top of that. What yes. town were you going to that was going to be open to that who wouldn't be where where what how, what environment were you going into and and i'm sure there were places in in the country that they just couldn't go right i mean oh no that, that's absolutely right and 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 that's an important part of it because the um understanding that barnstorming route was the key because there's one town that you make money and there's the next town right next door to it you don't and you have to skip those places and and understand and don't be the <laughs> To gain that understanding of where you are Mm -hmm. and what makes Satchel Paige um, vaulted to such um, 
uh, really deity in terms of yeah. uh, Negro League baseball players is that he got on that route, but only after John Donaldson brought him there and only after John Donaldson made that route. Yeah. And so they knew that. Um, and so he was able to be successful in different places because they had already been there and they'd already realized what it took to promote those games, to get crowds, to watch those games, et cetera, et cetera. But Satchel Paige does this in the 1930s and forties. Um, John Donaldson is doing this in 1910 and 1920. Mm -hmm. uh, that builds up so that they can make money. And it, it wasn't just stop anywhere you want to. No, it's, It was stop where you knew you could turn a profit. And that was a huge part of the money-making aspect of barnstorming baseball. Yep. And don't don't beat the stuffing too bad out of the local boys because you may want to come back. Oh, or, that's or absolutely you... <laughs> right. And, 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 and there's many, many, many instances where so, it's 10 to nothing, and it's the seventh inning, and it's the eighth inning, and John Donaldson lets the guy have a hit. Um, and that's not playing yes. the game. That's playing your audience. Exactly. That's, what, that's, that's a part of it. So, so does his ERA suffer? For sure it does. Does his uh, – uh, does his strikeout totals, are they inflated? Absolutely they are. They're, he's not playing against major leaguers. Yep. But I'm. But what the Donaldson Network is telling you is we're going to show you everything and let you decide. If you already think that it, it, yeah. his career doesn't matter, yeah. if you already think, I'm not going to change your mind. I, I'm not, I have no interest in trying to do that. Mm -hmm. What I have interest in doing is telling you that there are these stories where a, a, a section and a uh, part of our history has told us these stories don't exist. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely there. It is some place that our grandparents told us, didn't tell us about. We know mm -hmm. this now, mm -hmm. and we have to be able to tell as many people as we can. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> All right. So um, I'm going to take a son out to the ballpark here so we can Fantastic. see what this is like. So I've got up on the screen, and, and I, I've tried to cover this um, uh, every time I do this. But um, this is out of the park baseball 22 which is a baseball simulation uh unlike major league baseball the show similar to it in some respects that, that you have teams and players but you're not actually playing the game with a, a game pad or anything like that this is more uh management uh, we're going to see some graphics when we when we play but um we're not going to what what's do you know what stadium they played this at uh 1920 would be association park in kansas city where uh, they also was... had two or three years later was Mulebach Field came in or was eventually Mulebach Field, but they had stadium issues just like everyone today has. There's city council meetings. They want to build a new stadium. The Kansas City Monarchs clearly want to have some say in where the uh, the field is and how who controls the uh, the the gate. Uh, in 1923, they're helping to pay for this stadium because they're very popular. Um, they want to take a little more share in it from the minor league team that has traditionally controlled it. Um, Who was so, the home team Was uh, in this one? The was home it... team was the Kansas City Monarchs. All right, so I'm going to flip that. Go ahead, keep going. I'm just playing and so, around here. And so you have this sort of what we look at kind of today as a typical stadium battle, right? They're trying to figure out who – gets the key dates of these stadiums each year and the monarchs and jail wilkinson want to have a say in that um when the new stadium comes around 1924 well they need money to be able to do that mm -hmm. um how do you get money in that day you send john donaldson out on the barnstorming tour and start making money um so that they can the the kansas city monarchs can have more say in who gets to play and key dates um, they can all come together at the table and decide, divvy up the dates rather than just being on um, the monarchs were traditionally on the receiving end. You just get whatever's left over. Uh, that wasn't what they wanted to do. They wanted to try and make this a legitimate business and continue to make it a legitimate business. And in order to do that, they had to show capital and clout to do so. Okay. Did they play at Sportsman's Park? Do you know? I don't know that. All right. We're going to have them play at Sportsman's Park. Isn't, where was Sportsman's Park? In St. Louis? Wasn't that in St. Yeah, Louis? Yeah, 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 that's right. Yep. Yeah, so we're going to have them play there. Um, I don't know if they did or not. Um, I... So you, so what you're saying is you're, uh, you don't have the choice to have uh, Association Park in Kansas City. I do not um, yep. that have that. So unfortunately, um, some of this, I mean, as I tried to point out in, in this, is there's a... A limit um, 
a lot of it is community built. I mean, a lot of these things, sure. the game engine is what it is, but many of the historical uh, pieces to it, such as pictures and uniforms, ballparks, are, are actually built by the users. And, yep. and it's kind of a community, uh, you know, project almost to, to enhance it as much as you can with the logos and the, you know, various things. So uh, it, it kind of makes sure. it uh, a little bit uh, more fun because you're, 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 you're more invested in it, maybe, you know, because you're actually contributing to this whole effort to make the game better. And, and that's really no know. different than our research project. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I mean, that's it's really no different at was, all. You just find more people who are more interested in it, who can advance the ball a little bit more, who can take an interest in that and, and be able to have resources to be able to do so. Uh, that's what we build our network on. It's funny. I, I, I that, that, that analogy, that, that comparison uh, came up um, in my mind because it, it really, the game started 20, this is version 22. So I was, I've been around since it first started playing it, buying it. And yeah, uh, it, it was um, uh, a couple of guys who had an idea and wanted to model, you know, a, a game based on more the European because they're from Germany, sure. uh, more the, um, the way that games in Europe are designed around management and, and uh, financials and things like that. And, and not the, you know, controlling and pitching and all that kind of, you know, sure. running the bases. So it, it made it more, um, uh, but as they started it, it grew and, and, and people contributed and they added to it and they added this and they added that and things got better. And here's where it is today. And I, I just think it, it, for these types of projects, it just makes it so much fun because of the what if. I mean, you could do any what if you want at any point in history with whoever you want. So what, what I've done here is, is I've taken the 1920 season that I had going already, which included the uh, regular Major League Pennant race, I had the Texas League in there. I had the Negro National League. And so I've also created now a barnstorming circuit. So I've set up some all of the Negro League teams and some of the barnstorming teams from box scores that you or, or others have sent me. So I know that uh, we've got now the Casey Stengel All-Stars, which included, uh, and you have much more information on that that we'll talk about, uh, which included... Uh, players from several teams. Um, I've got in here the Beloit Leaguers, which was which was a uh, kind of, I guess they were kind of a semi-pro Kansas team sure. that had some players. Uh, the Arkansas Travelers, a minor league team. I've added. I've even got the Kansas City Blues, which was a uh, uh, double A. Well, I don't know what level they were actually in. Oh, they were a couple different. Twenty, sure. but you know we can see some of the players on here. Oscar Horstman. Uh, Bunny Brief, who you you mentioned was a heck of a slugger in the minor leagues. I mean, I don't know if anybody knew who Bunny Brief was, but you know, if you look at his uh, minor league statistics, the man could he does all right. He could swing the bat. Forty two home runs in nineteen twenty one, uh, playing for the Kansas City Blues. Forty in nineteen twenty two, and that's the fascinating thing about all this. You get all of this history of all of these players. So I created the nineteen twenty Kansas City Blues. So if I want to play the Kansas City Monarchs versus the Blues for the city championship, as they did back in those days, mm -hmm. uh, best of whatever it was, five or six or whatever. Nine. We, would they play nine? No kidding. Sometimes. I mean, wow. I know Negro, in different Negro League situations, there were longer um, series. Awesome. So we've got the Casey Stingle All-Stars, and they're going to be playing the Kansas City Monarchs, and that is based on a box score uh, that you sent me. We're going to have the actual lineups uh, as they played them, and we'll take first a look at, I guess, the Casey Stingle All-Stars. And you can... When Casey Stingle was a player... Still a player, yes. I, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, yeah, you know, all these guys before they became great managers, they were players. I mean, uh, you know, they didn't just they didn't just jump into the into the dugout <laughs> and do it. So yeah, back in these days, let's take a look real quick. I'll throw up Casey Stingle, uh, his. Um... Yeah, and a lot of the interesting part about Casey Stingle is that he grew up in Kansas City, right in the time when all these players are um, great Negro League players are playing there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's just ridiculous to think that he didn't have opinions on every one of them. Sure. Now, what he could share in public when he's sitting on the bench in Brooklyn or wherever um, is another question. But the, uh, you know, he's not likely to come out with his opinion on how he should be hiring black baseball players and. Mm -hmm you know, very often because that was against what his employer really wanted him to do. And so there's reasons that he wouldn't be outspoken about bringing bullet rogue into his um, professional to the uh, major leagues mm -hmm. uh, as a professional. The, uh, 
but he knew all these guys. It's impossible to think that Casey Stengel didn't have intimate right. knowledge of the league baseball players. Well, it's interesting, right? Because when I pull this up, I mean, uh, he was a pretty solid, pretty very, very good outfielder, I think, defensively, um, a nominal hitter, but but certainly, you know, um, he was more than functional. And, and he started in 1910 with the Kansas City Blues. How about that? Yeah. Interesting. I wonder what he did in 1911. Uh, I mean, maybe they just didn't have the records for Kansas City back in these days. But then he jumps to Brooklyn. I'm not sure who M-O-R-E is. Double A level team. Um, I'm not sure. I have to look and see who that might be. And then he gets into Brooklyn in 1913 and continues his career all the way through. Uh, this 1920 season. He has a pretty, probably his career year, it looked like. 292 with nine home runs. Uh, not He's going to be a tough out. Yeah, not a, not, a bad, uh, not a bad season at all. So let's take a look, and you can, you can give some insights on maybe on some of these guys because I'm not even familiar with a lot of these guys. So uh, leading off was their first baseman, Gene Paulette. Gene Paulette. What does my note say? My note says <laughs> Philadelphia. Yes. First baseman. There he is. Uh, had a home run, hit 288 in 1920. 29 years old. So, yeah, he was a regular first baseman. Hit 562 at bats that year. Interesting. Tony. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, it's important to think about right now how these major league all star teams, barnstorming teams, came together. There you go. I mean, yeah. That to brought touch. together by somebody. Yes. So, you know, because, look, we're looking at this guy, Tony Bokel. Uh, so you have Gene Paulette from the Phillies. You've got Casey Stengel. Was he on the Giants in 1920? I didn't even notice. I, I, where, where was he? Uh, Casey Stengel was with Philadelphia in 1920. And so now here's Tony Bokel, though. He is in 1920 on the Boston Braves. Yep. Interesting. Uh, let's see who else. Now, Irish Musial. Uh, was Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Nice career he had as well. 300 hitter for his career. Then there's Long Bob Musial, who I think most people are going to remember him from the Yankees. I wonder how he wound up. He's still. He's only 23. How's he? Yeah, how's just he, a chat, little chap. Yeah, how's he? How's he barnstorming with Casey Stingle if he's a Yankee in 1920? I'd love to know what that connection was. Interesting. Well, because, his brother Irish was playing with Philadelphia. Ah, well. probably so, brought him along. Did. That's right. Yeah, we were all on our train ride home back to California. I believe those guys are from California. Uh, there you go. Right, and this is how they did it: barnstorming. Yeah, because like you pointed out before, you've got to take the modern day context out of this. This isn't yeah. getting on a plane and flying to Kansas City and then flying off to Seattle the next day. This was a process to do all these things. Um, and so, you know, Bob Musial, I mean, he, he was members of the the uh, legendary Yankee teams of the 20s, the 27 Yankees, uh, his career year that year, 337. He was a heck of a ball player. But in 1920, where we're going to see him, He's uh, a 23-year-old kid. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that's to, to me is an interesting point in terms of uh, does anybody know these guys either? I mean, for a modern, not very many, I'm sure. That's right? right. I mean, not very, very few people on in the main. If have you're a big Yankee fan, you might. If you're a big Yankee fan, you probably know Bob uh, Long Bob Musial, but not the rest of most of these guys. That's for sure. That's right. Uh, here's another Boston Brave um, and a Philadelphia. So both team connection here. Johnny Rawlings, the second baseman for this team. Red. Red Rawlings, yeah. There you go. And then uh, I, this is one of my favorite guys from this time period just because I love his name, Cotton Tierney. Cotton Tierney, sure. <laughs> another Kansas City. So here you go. Cotton Tierney is from Kansas City. So there's a yep. connection there. Where, let's see where he played. Um, Pittsburgh. So there you go. So he happened to be – he's home now after the season, right? This is yep. probably what happened here. And they probably. Said, hey, man, come on and play. Uh, Bring some I, of your buddies. Okay. We'll put on an exhibition game. We'll make money. Everybody will leave with 25 bucks in their pocket. That's right. We'll go out drinking afterwards. <laughs> That's right. So let, let's, let's put that uh, out there. 
Casey Stengel, his name wasn't Casey, as in Casey at the bat. He was nicknamed Casey for, because he was from Kansas City. <laughs> I wonder how many people actually even know that. Casey, yeah. <laughs> and then there's Walter Schmidt, who might be the uh, elder statesman on this team at 33. Uh, another pirate. Not sure how he wound up on this team because um, he is from London, Ohio, it says. Friends with somebody, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. And happened to be in Absolutely. town visiting his sister-in-law. Who knows, right, why these guys did what they did. And on the mound for the uh, Casey Stingle All-Stars is Lee Meadows. I love the picture with his glasses. I wonder how many guys even wore glasses back in those days. <laughs> yep, big Lee Meadows. I don't know anything about Lee Meadows, but here I am telling you things I don't know anything about. But 1920, he had a 16 and 14 record with a 2.84 ERA. Uh, He's a burner. Pretty good, uh, pretty good season for yeah, uh, the Phillies. Were were probably not in their prime. The Phillies were probably not in their prime for most of their <laughs> existence, actually. Right. So to win 16 games for the Phillies was uh, was a uh, an accomplishment. And so the Monarchs for this particular game. They're going to have uh, Hurley McNair leading off in left, mm -hmm. uh, Tank Carr at first, John Donaldson's in center field hitting third. So, you know, there, there's something we talked about last time, but we could bring it up again. These guys didn't just um, – they, they weren't as specialized as maybe today or recent baseball is, right? If you were a starting pitcher back in these days, you probably um, – you know, played some other positions as well and, and, and so forth. But to give you the testament of how good John Donaldson was, he's hitting third on this team. <laughs> so he wasn't just a pitcher. This, this man could play the game of baseball um, as a hitter and a fielder as well. Center Power hitter, base stealer. But, I mean, there you go. Center field bat and third on a team. Go back to your Little League days. Who were the guys? <laughs> you're, usually it was your pitcher, your catcher, your shortstop, and your center fielder that were the stars of the team, right? So, uh, you know, Bullet Rogan's going to hit fourth and pitch. So it tells you who the stars were uh, back in these days as well. Most definitely. That, that's that hasn't changed at all. Not at all. I was at a Little League game last night. And the, and something that is completely aside for that, but. In Little League, the cut from the left fielder to home plate is taken by the shortstop. Why? Because the shortstop is probably the best player on the team. Typically and traditionally, the cut from the left fielder to home plate is the third baseman. Yeah. Um, but not in Little League, it's not, because you need to go through your best player. That's right. And he probably was going to pitch the next day, and he probably batted clean up or third on the team, right? Right. Yeah, just like John Donaldson and Bullet Rogan and some of these guys, the same exact right. thing. The, the, the question was, how do they get John Donaldson to pitch every day? Yep. And that is not possible. It, believe me, there's plenty of stretches in his mm -hmm. career where he, he does almost every day right. take them out, um, which probably limited his 33-year career. <laughs> Sure did, yeah. And, right. you know, <clears throat> that's something that's interesting, right? Because um, so many uh, injuries with pitchers, especially uh, today. And and there was someone significant, I can't remember, who just got injured the other day. But, um, you know, it's going to be a 10, 12-month missing rehabilitation situation, right, because of a T Tommy John surgery. Because it's max effort every day. And, and you know, today um, – because you have a long-term contract and if I get hurt, you don't want to see it, but if somebody gets hurt, they're still going to get paid <laughs> whether they never oh, pitch right. again, right? If, right? if John Donaldson was pitching every day, he had to have something in the tank. And if he got injured, his he'd have to go do what? What would, what would John Donaldson go do? Uh, be a mechanic? I mean, what, what, what would happen? Well, he was a very talented individual. Um, most likely, he would have been a preacher. He was a classically trained uh, Methodist minister. How about that? Mm -hmm. I learned something new every day, I'm telling you. <laughs> he went to college and um, to a place, a seminary college, to be a, his mom wanted him to be a preacher. No kidding. That is yeah. so cool. Like Billy Sunday. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Billy Sunday was right in that time period. But That's right. The church was a career. 
Yeah. Baseball it still is was not yeah. a career. <laughs> no, baseball is not a career. Was back in these days was not. Yeah. Was not a career anybody wanted anybody's children to get into. Mm-hmm. Because oh, yeah, baseball sure. players were brawlers and drinkers and smokers and carousers and ah. very limited um uh, opportunity to so, have that as a profession so interesting right now it goes back to something that you've said in the past about the demeanor of john donaldson makes sense now that he was uh, uh could have been a preacher and, and that's the way he carried himself i'm sure right absolutely as more more of a um he was gathering souls for baseball <laughs> <laughs> that's right so we, so we have the blank spot in the lineup here but that's that's going to be bullet rogan uh fifth doby moore at shortstop uh jose mendez at third vicente rodriguez at catching catcher joaquin arumas at second and this game Otto ray in right field not normally their right fielder uh, normally that was who um I can't, I can't. A lot of different guys played right uh, field for Kansas City Monarchs. Uh, and so, like you talked about, this lineup it is most of their regulars, but, you yeah. know, cobbled together a few guys who maybe not. And, On a and, cold October day in Kansas City. I mean, right. And so the we're actually playing this one on June the second. Just to we got to have a little, oh, really? little, po- little poetic little license sunshine? here. A little poetic okay. license here, but. All right. But, you know, one of the things that, that I wanted you to, to, to point out just uh, on this real quick, too, is, uh, and we've talked about this, is <clears throat> the Kansas City Monarchs were a barn, barnstorming team, and their roots come from the barnstorming uh, days of uh, all nations. And, yeah. and then some of the, many of these players on this team also were uh, on the 25th Infantry Wreckers of, like, Tank yeah. Carr, Dolby Moore, uh, and and Bullet Rogan, so that connection to this team is is fascinating as well. Also, yeah, there's so there's that military guys, and the Los Angeles White Sox were a integrated team in the California Winter League, um, and they were the only black team in the league. And that start was in 1916. And wow. John Donaldson goes out there as their star, plays out of uh, uh, in Los Angeles. Interesting. Um, and and these guys are some some remnants. Kansas City Monarchs have remnants with the Los Angeles White Sox as well. What uh, what league was that in? California in? Winter League. So okay. you get off season major leaguers um, playing for local teams in California. Awesome, very very cool. Yeah, I... and very unknown part of a history. There's a great book out there by Bill McNeil. Um, it talks about the California Winter League and how important it was. I mean, these guys went back home and they would play baseball all year round because mm-hmm. you could there mm-hmm. um and what john donaldson was able to do was be brought out there to play against major leaguers and played against many of them mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> during, during his time there but then there's financial problems there's a tragic uh, death at the ballpark um classic uh, stereotypical uh blaming the black team for this problem <laughs> Um, yeah. They start, They take them out of the league. They stop paying the salaries. And now John Donaldson's standing in Los Angeles. Um, nobody's paying him anymore. What does he do now? Jose Mendez is there with him. Um, there's a uh, great and very colorful history of, uh, of the California Winter League. Very cool. I'm going to have to check it out. So real quick, just to wrap up on how I put this together. So again, it was, it was taking that 1920 season, importing in the Negro League teams, importing in uh, the players into some of these various teams from the major league teams and, and creating all of these barnstorming. And I could add more and we can have uh, others, but just kind of fun. Uh, we, we talked about, uh, you mentioned earlier before we got on here about how everybody wanted to see Babe Ruth. I mean, I don't know how many people realize this, um, how much barnstorming that Babe Ruth and, and uh, Lou Gehrig and players like that did. I mean, there was the Bustin' Babes and <laughs> various other teams that he played on. Uh, and so he, he, we we can get we can do that. We'll, we'll do one of these down the road. We'll get Babe Ruth. Well, I mean, it game. wasn't until that mean, old, Kennesaw Mountain Landis commissioner guy came in and said, "We can't, you can't do this." Well, I was pulling teeth for those guys because you're mm-hmm. taking money right out of their pockets. That's right. Did you know? You probably did know this, but um, that he he's also Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Not only did he continue the color barrier in baseball, but he also started a, a, a gender barrier. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the guy, the guy, I mean, I know he was brought in uh, to supposedly clean up the, the, the gambling situation that was going on. And I'm, and I'm sure, uh, you know, 
that he had some impact on that. But uh, to continue that, then then he he banned uh, uh, any females playing in the minors or anywhere. You couldn't. I mean, it was well. His job his was legacy. his what his legacy turns out to be was enforcing societal norms at that time. Yeah. Uh, yeah he may true. have been a really bad guy, but I'm sure he was falling back on his uh, judicial, uh, you know, the, the precedence that it was all right to treat people in a different way mm -hmm. than we do today. All right. Uh, well, we got, why is Joe Casey? It stuck Joe Casey in the lineup here. I, I want to, I want to change that. All right. Uh, Casey Stengel lineup. I want to make sure we have, so we got Paulette Bogle, Irish, Long Bob, Casey Stengel. Who was sixth? I had it before, but see, the game, you know, the, the AI is now looking at things here. Johnny Rawlings, we had him in there, right? Red Rawlings. Yep. Cotton Tierney. So Joe Casey is the guy that it, uh, that it um, seems to have substituted. <laughs> Let's see if it'll let me change this. Oh, uh, man, because I want to make sure we got it right here. Absolutely. Well, do what uh, you can. You're the yeah, czar, right? We got Lee Meadows on here. Yeah, I should be able to... Um, Should be able to get him the heck out of there, I would think. Maybe I need to change this. Substitutions to Rube Foster. <laughs> and let me see if I can change this. Hey, we'll take Rube Foster. Right? Uh, let's see. If well, not can... against us. There we go. So now let me drag Walter Schmidt over there. And now let's take a look at the, um, the Monarchs lineup. McNair, it's got Rogan second. There'll be more cleanup because it, it, yeah. So let me fix that. Yeah, we're under the hood now, huh? Yeah, you know, yeah, you got, um, so, so the game, you can literally let the computer AI take care of anything you want it to take care of. You can, you can have it, um, uh, it's got Edgar Washington in there. I don't know why. Got a bunch of Jim Unknowns. I don't know why it's got Jim Unknowns in there. It's looking at the Kansas City Monarchs. Yeah, maybe. There's Tank Carr second. Donaldson. Otto Ray goes down here. Arumas goes here. Rodriguez, Mendez, Moore, and the pitcher spots. Okay, so we got it. I'm not sure why there's Jim Unknowns showing up there. That's interesting. Can I pick anybody? <laughs> you know, a lot of this, because it's coming, there's a database of statistics and, and everything else behind the scenes that it's pulling uh, information from. So um, maybe when I was, uh, I don't know, do, do we want to leave it on Rube Foster and we make any substitutions? Because I, I want to leave those guys, if they, I'm sure they played the whole game because um, I didn't want to... Uh, because I don't want them like pinch hitting for somebody like in the fourth inning. I'd rather so we'll we'll just let it to our okay. doing substitutions. Hey, so let's, so let's get let's on. Learn up. about these guys. I know a thing or two about Rube Foster. Right. All right. So let's get on out to the ballpark and see how this goes. Sportsman's Park. And let's take a look. I hear some crowd noise going on here. here All right. Go. Here we are. And here is Bullet Rogan on the hill. Gene Paulette. I didn't. Oh, I didn't notice the um, what the attendance was. It probably threw it up when we were first getting in. It, we'll see it at the end when the box score comes up. Yeah. All right, here we go. This is. Uh, let me. I just want to take one real quick look at the um, at the camera angles because sometimes they're a little funky uh, as far as where it's showing. So wide pitch camera view. Action camera view, dynamic, yes. Yeah, we'll leave it at that and see what the what it looks like. So here we go. First pitch from Bullet Rogan to Gene Paulette. 63 degrees in Kansas City. Beautiful day. Yeah. On the ground at Doby Moore. One away. You wanna do uh you wanna do the color play by play? How you wanna do this? Well, I think it's beautiful. That's an out right there. Any <laughs> out we can get is what we want, right? That's right. Uh-huh. 
Jose Mendez over at third base. There's you know, Jose Mendez. There's Jose Mendez at third. Um, Fantastic story, Jose Mendez. His um, Cuban stars roots went to the All Nations. Uh, played with John Donaldson, rode on a train car with John Donaldson for thousands and thousands of miles, um, amassed statistics and records um, that the Hall of Fame didn't want when they decided on Jose Mendez, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was curious. But the um, so we have literally hundreds of games that Jose Mendez played in that nobody knows anything about. Um, John Donaldson, oh, boy. The, the Donaldson Network has that a part of our list. Mm -hmm. Another worthwhile project, I'm sure. That was another thing I wanted to point out to people. Uh, where I, where uh, the other day I, I put out about um, the efforts to put uh, Josh Gibson his name onto the MVP trophy, and and you know you get the pushback. You get the people who say they're minor leaguers, that kind of thing. And and you know I said the thing that that really is is you got to step back here. This wasn't just a color barrier on on uh, African American players no. this was a color barrier on anybody whose skin was the darkest hue any any darker hue and and that included you know jose mendez and cubans and dominicans and and uh, uh puerto ricans you you name it you were all stuck behind the color barrier if you looked too dark for anybody's taste and right. kevin l mitchell mentioned about cristobal torriente he wasn't as dark skinned as many cubans actually had no john donaldson but but uh, there, his hair was too kinky or something. He he said this no. story, and that was why he couldn't pass muster to get into uh, the uh, pipeline and get into the majors. So, uh, anyway. well, it's a it's a it's a societal issue, um, mm -hmm. one we don't want to do anything with anymore. I mean, I think that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is we need to be able to recognize their legacies in order to move forward in a in a meaningful way and, and for uh, good or bad for good or bad all that happened back in those days and, and continued for quite some time even after 1920 obviously but and well before that but it, 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 it shaped who we are what we are how we think in so many ways good and bad and they just gotta you know recognize it uh, it's not hard to recognize no so we got Tony Bokel with a base hit and his Irish Musial oh Bokel's on the way he's running a, a major league team steals bases? What? Bokel, Bokel just stole second. Yeah. How about uh, that? That's not possible. Let's there must be something going on here. Let's take a look at Tony Bokel. In 1920, he had four steals. Well, he had 11 steals the year before. Actually, wait a minute. In 1919, he had 21 steals. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, 10 for the Pittsburgh Pirates in 45 games. Uh, 11 and 45 games, and then 10 with the Boston Braves. So, yeah, the guy had uh, good enough to get him traded to Boston. A little bit of wheels. Two of the two of the not the most successful franchises back in these days of the National League, right? Right. Well, we're trading quote unquote. Oh, that's hit leader. deep. That's deep to left. Yeah, this guy hits a lot of them. Oh, but it's tracked down. Look at that funky, funky wall out there. Yeah, look at that Sportsman Park. What what is that? It's like it's like it juts out into uh, another deeper corner. We talked about this, but if you want to elaborate real quick while I'm moving along here, uh, the, the the so you had all of these different aspects of the game, but the stadiums back in these days, some were just cavernous. I mean, like yeah. the Polo Grounds was 500 and some odd feet to center field, 460, yeah. 480 into power alleys. I mean, yes. this was not. You were not here swinging from the heels to hit home runs. It was a different no. game. It was a different Hugely game. Hugely different game. Station to station, what we would call it station to station today. Um, yeah, five. And in these barnstorming places and different places that they go, they would ring the field with cars. And so you'd hit the phone <laughs> with the cars, and you, of course, weren't going to run into the Model A bumper. <laughs> so that went into the cars. That was a double. Yep. While we're, um, going, while we're going along here, uh, you, maybe you could talk about this as well for, for uh, people, but, you know, uh, the J.L. Wilkinson model. I mean, you talk about, you know, visionary guys. I mean, Rube Foster, visionary. Uh, you know, Gus Greenlee with what he did, building his own ballpark. A lot of visionary owners uh, were in the meager leagues. J.L. Wilkinson with lights, the first stadium to have lights was actually a meager league game. But he, he started with a, 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 a women's team. Yep. <laughs> He started with the um, Hopkins Brothers Bloomer Girl team, 
Um, and that was uh, in the late 05, 06, something like that. He was a player, first of all. Um, ended up realizing that they could travel around by train um, and had a, uh, you know, a, a bloomer girl team. So it was several um, females, but then there were a couple of guys who'd wear dresses and uh, long hair. And, uh, right, the ringers, right? Yeah, and they had a couple of guys like that, and that was Smokey, part of this. Including Smokey Joe Wood and Rogers Hornsby and players of that caliber. That type of thing happened a little bit later, but yes, there was... Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, there was opportunities for people to do that. you got to understand that this is the entertainment of the day. And to denigrate that as bad baseball yeah. and poo-poo that in 2021 because yeah. that's, you know, they, there wasn't um, movies and there wasn't obviously radio or television or anything like that. This was their opportunity. Look, what did uh, um, guys like Christy Matthewson do in the offseason? They were vaudeville actors. Yes. Um, and some of the great, great players were we're able to do that and supplement their income in the off season. So to have this sort of thought of as less than, because that's, I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Are we going to so, count Rogers Hornsby's at bats when he's playing on a bloomer girl team? Probably not, but no. right. And, and then no one would argue that. Um, so we also can't denigrate just because uh, Negro league players were barnstorming and traveling around. They did what they had to do. Sports. They did yeah. what they had to do. So that J.O. Wilkinson story, uh, so he goes from the the uh, Hopkins Sporting Hopkins Goods, yep. forms all nations, and then all nations becomes the Monarchs. So right. uh, all of those, I mean, he, he literally had his own train, right, that, that yes. traveled around and carried all of their equipment and lighting and fencing and a band and you name it with them, right? Well, there's the, the, the all nations played night baseball games in 1912 yeah think about that every you know people right <laughs> and he found this thing called the swain system at the um, technology building at the iowa state fair in 1910 and so his bloomer girls team traveled with the lighting plant first and then once they started getting figuring out that he could get the guys the likes of john donaldson jose mendez um uh, several other great players to play on the all nations team then they started playing night games with them. So, he, it, you know, the, the, the formula is the same. Try mm -hmm. it out, figure out what works, moreover, figure out what doesn't work, and then go out there and uh, make money doing it. And they made lots of money doing it. He was a master uh, marketer and innovator and show And worthy of the Hall of Fame that he is. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, many of the things that he contributed are beyond the game it is really fascinating jl wilkinson and, and rube foster these own well rube foster of course was a he probably could have been a hall of fame pitcher uh yes. you know he he's a, he he's another level of uh he was not only a a hall of fame caliber player but a man hall of fame caliber manager and a hall of fame cal caliber owner i mean he takes it to all three levels of all he didn't he probably wrote i don't know did Rob Foster probably wrote oh well, he wrote all the time yeah he was so written the, in newspapers all the time so there you go uh all right here's donaldson um who made the final out a nice catch in center field to retire long bob usual here's yeah well, how did we miss that uh-huh on the ground that's a slow roller better hurry oh he's did he beat it out no that's a close play all right, so we're going to go to the top of the second inning. Here's Casey Stengel. Uh, the last thing I want to say about the, um, well, not the last thing, but a, a thing about the All Nations team that's interesting. Um, in a newspaper in Chicago in 1916, there was an article written about, look, people, black people and white people can play on the same team. How about that? They huh? can live in harmony. Look at this. T touch um, on touch on who else was on that team because it was a fascinating group. Well, every year the, the roster changes. I mean, it changes all the time, but Torrienti plays on that team. Mm -hmm. um, Rogan plays on that team. Um, some of the guys that are playing today are on those teams. Uh, Hurley McNair. Uh, different players. But it was a, um, a, a harbinger of things that, to come. Mm -hmm. I mean, what Wilkinson realized in 1910 was what we know today. Uh, but it was with a certain amount of astonishment that <coughs> you could actually have people with different of different races play on a baseball team together. How that about was the that, thing right? that was they thought that wasn't possible uh, because of how wide the segregation gap was. Mm -hmm. 
So the Monarchs get a base hit from Mendez. He steals second base, but they strand him. We're in the third inning. Who's up? Walter Sch Schmidt. Here comes Lee Meadows. Scoreless ball game. Meadows hits that, lost that one to. That's a lead off. Lead out. Yeah, it was a long out there. Two men out. And Gene Paulette. Kind of fun. I mean, I, you know, this is, I mean, this is just a simulation, but it's fun. You get to, you get to see, learn, yeah. have a little fun with it. I mean, I like I the way they round first base. <laughs> right. That was a replay, right? <laughs> right. Or is that two straight flyouts? Two yeah. straight flyouts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Arumas puts a jack into that one. Oh, but look at that. Look at that stadium, right? How it goes to a point. I bet you that's probably about 550 oh, feet. To Center field out there. Otto Ray. Oh, Otto. There just wasn't the, at that time. There just wasn't the concentration on the long ball. No. Uh, that wasn't the, the origins of the game. The origins of the game were not swing from the heels and rip it 500 feet. No. That was not. There's a triple. Wow. Yeah, Otto Ray yeah, banged that went. one off the wall for a triple. He's he's a catcher too. He must have been lumbering, <laughs> lumbering around. Um, you know, and that's that's like we talked about the differences in the game. There wasn't the specialization. The stadiums were cavernous. The uh, pitchers had a pitch every day, every other day, every you know, play other positions. I mean, it, it was a different different game, and, and no long term contracts, no free agency, all sorts of things that made the game different. Doesn't make it less of a game. You know, it's like any game. You have to you have to go with the cards that you're dealt, right? <laughs> But, so, you know, in a lot of ways, that's the way what the Negro Leagues had to do. Hurley McNair is going to get the Monarchs on top with that ground out. I tell you what, that Hurley McNair is a great story. Yeah, he's is another a, under underappreciated player, I think. Yep. Yes. Five foot six inch left handed power hitter. Five foot six. Comes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, he was a Jose Altuve before there was such a thing. How about that? I'll tell and you he what. played for many teams uh, out of Chicago um, in the 1910s, 1920s. Uh, but Chicago Giants, Chicago American Giants, um, Gilkerson's Union Giants, Hurley McNair was a uh, and huge art former and contemporary of John Donaldson. He was the whole package too, right? He could play some defense. He had a little, he had power. He had a little bit of speed. I mean, he he could he could do it all as an outfielder. He was a good good ball player. That's right. And I think a microcosm of what you were talking about the game difference. Just like I said, I mean, a lot of these barnstorming games had cars in the outfield. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> they park them on the outfield. That's right. And and that's a difference in the game, for sure. Um, but that's what we were doing at that time. Mm -hmm. Here's Donaldson facing Lee Meadows. There goes Tank Carr. And he is out of there. Ooh, that's a tough one. They leave Donaldson at the plate. He'll get the lead off the next inning. The don't, Monarchs... uh, don't tag Hank Tank Carr close to his face. He was a movie actor. I, I, I said this the last time we did this. Every picture I have seen of him, Bogle, two for two, uh, he just has this look on his face. Uh, he just had to be a riot. I mean, he had this, like, like mischievous, like, half a smirk. I mean, his pictures are fantastic. We're going to talk about uh, when, when uh, Greg Kreindler is on uh, next week. Uh, he, uh -huh. did that, he did that 184-card set. He's done so many paintings and of not just... Obviously, the Negro League players, but the um, but Major League players, some of those paintings are in the Hall of Fame. Oh, my goodness, that is crushed by by Musial off the wall. I think we've got to be careful with Musial. That ball is bouncing around. Oh, what is going on here? That's an inside-the-park home run, I think. Make the play. It was. That's an inside-the-park home run for Bob, for... Uh, for Irish Musial and puts the Casey Stingle Stars up two to one. The um, two of his favorite players are that he enjoyed. He said painting were, was yep. Jose Mendez and Tank Carr, and for those reasons, they just had very interesting features and and their demeanor, and it just makes them. You, you wish you, I mean, boy, oh boy, you wish you could have met some of these guys. You really do. I mean, <laughs> well, been, Greg uh, is a great uh, supporter of ours as well. He did a masterful painting of John Donaldson, uh, which is a part of that set. Yes. He's a great, uh, I had a chance, chance to meet him and have him uh, and talk about his art form. And 
I, I, he, he fascinates me. I, the, the, the paintings he does, I mean, uh, and to bring these guys to life, many of which, you know, you haven't seen any of these guys in color. Uh, no, absolutely. Black and white pictures. Opening, <laughs> I went to the opening at the Negro League Baseball Museum last February, not a year ago. Donaldson with a base hit. There you go. Um, and uh, it was breathtaking to be able to see some of these guys that I spent so much time thinking about. Um actually in color uh, was really really uh, it's a whole affirming, nother... affirming for what I was doing yep I'm sure uh, yeah it puts a whole another perspective brings them to life right absolutely Ooh, Doby Moore with a high fly ball to right oh but it's caught against the fence back there here's Mendez Mendez we hit that hard but right at the left field of Musial I got you got to send him now there he goes no, that was the oh. third out, yeah. They they almost picked him off, but he dove back safe. <laughs> Cotton, well, I'm just kind of surprised there that they go down 2-1 to one and that the Negro Leaguers wouldn't yeah. nickel and dime it a little bit more. Walter Schmidt with a base hit. Bruce Meadows. Now, you think, with, I don't know if they could, he is bunting. And they get the out. Wait, wait, wait a second. Major leaguers never bunted. <laughs> I, I wonder if they did back in these days, you know? I would have put the Negro leaguers at five or six. Oh, Paulette before. with the base hit. Let's see. He's coming home. They got a shot at him, but he's safe. Three to one Stengel. Now, what was the actual real final score of this game? I don't even remember. I'm going to look it up here. One to zero. One to nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. On a top of the ninth inning home run by Musel. So they battled it at nine innings with zeros. Wow. Rodriguez walks. Arumas. Arumas bunts. Well, hard last time. Yeah, he bunts, though, this time. Moves the runner up to second base. That's probably what they should. Here we go. Here's Otto Ray, who tripled and scored the Monarchs' run. All right, Otto, we need roller. another tripler. Nope. Grounds out. Two men out. Let's see if uh, the top of the order can pick him up here. Hurley McNair. Move him over, right? Ah, but a ground out. So three to one, Ken Casey Stingle stars lead it. Bottom. Now we're heading to the sixth. Here's the other musial. That's a fair ball. It looks like. Hugged the line. <laughs> He's in there with a double. So the musial boys have been in the middle of uh, all of the scoring here so far. That's going to move the room. Oh, that's an infield single. Why didn't he throw that one? Musial boys are on the corners with nobody out. Here's Casey. But it might be two. The second one. Nope. They played another run. Four to one. And they are teeing off on Rogan. So how many, do you know how many times they played each other back in 1920? These uh, two teams? Yeah. I three. believe it was a two or three game series, but it was look, more every than time, one. The, every time that these uh, uh, weather was always a factor, right? Uh, right, they might have wanted to play three games and got two in. Um, yeah, who had to leave? Who had to go? Who was the roster right. the same? <clears throat> you, would have, for... you would have seen a, a, a change in the roster. Well. Absolutely right. I mean, that that's another thing that I think. Uh, People need to understand that about some of these barnstorming games. I mean, you might have had uh, the car steal second again. There he goes. Rogan with a drive to left, but caught out there in that cavernous left left field corner where the scoreboard is. <laughs> wow, two men out is Doby Moore. I don't know how you don't move up on that. He did. He went from second to third, but that was his, that was it. We're heading to the seventh. Lee Meadows hits that one pretty far. That's it, Lee Meadows. But hauled in by McNair. Gene Paulette. Base hit. Rogan has not had his best stuff this game. We watched the last time we did it. That might be two there, though. Nope, they only get one. Donaldson threw the shutout against the... Um, who did they play? I don't even remember. Um, 
the uh, the game we played that was against Monarchs and the American Giants. And the American Giants, that's right. Uh, yeah, Torriente had uh, three of the five hits or something off of uh, Donaldson in that game. And these guys generally would pitch the whole game, right? When they were out That's there, right. this, this was not something that wow. they were... Uh... In these exhibition games, oh, it was a little different, catch. too. They could... Casey Stengel diving for that one. Look at that. If you had a particular star, you'd play him. So I don't think there was... In these exhibition games, there was as much of the, uh, you know, gut it off the whole way. And some there of these... always another star to yeah. go in. And I'm Kinda sure... Like I'm sure in some of these games, they probably had more... Uh... Uh, in, in terms of attendance than they may have had for some of the Major League Baseball games. Well, for sure, in places like Kansas City, I mean, they had there was no Major League. So, yeah, they had huge attendance. And St. Louis, the Browns, uh, probably were not the best draw. <laughs> no. So, no. Yeah. So St. Louis had, a, uh, yeah, lots of different options for your baseball buying public. All right, we're in seven. We're in the bottom of the eighth. Let's see if the Monarchs can make have a rally going here. Oh, I think they got it in them, don't they? Yeah, I'm sure, sure they can. They get hit into the top of the order. If they're going to do it, it's going to be now at McNair. Let's see if Meadows is tiring a little bit. Yes, he walks McNair. Here's Tank uh, Carr. Hurley Carr's McNair was. They called him one of the greatest hitters of all time. Just a pure natural hitter. Um, no wonder he's on base. Oh, dropped out there. That might be a big error. What was that? Who dropped that one? Musial. Irish Musial out and left just dropped that pop-up. Uh-oh, Donaldson. Two on, one out. Let's see if he can make that error hurt. Uh-oh. That might be two. No, they get the fielder's choice. So if Boom Rogan can help himself here, get back in the ball game. Two on and two outs. You got to go on this first pitch. Oh, and he struck him out. Rogan leaves two on. We're going to the ninth. Still four to one. Walter Schmidt. Sad. Boy, he is. I'll tell you what, Walter Schmidt has had a ball game. Yeah. <laughs> I should have let them play Joe Casey, right? <laughs> Joe, right. Whoever Joe Casey was. That's a gapper. Meadows has got a, uh, a double and a triple now, I think, in the game. Here's Meadows. He's probably bunting. He bunts again. Man, I'll tell you what. Oh, they go to third. Yeah, they do. And they get Schmidt. Wow, that was sure. a heck of a play. By... How about that? Tank Carr yeah. with the heads-up play. He was heading right towards third. So I guess that's why you'd make that play. You could see the player all in front. You got to be really. You got to get a really bad jump not to get to third base on that one. Tell me I know, the right? Well, he's a catcher, them. right? Maybe he's a catcher. Who knows? Portsman Park. Had Tony Vocal. Uh-oh, Bogle. That's deep to left. Double. No, caught by uh, McNair out there. Let's see if, if, if they got to keep the game close here. If usual, I should get out of the inning here. And they do. We're going to go to the ninth. 4-1 Stengel Stars are up. And Dobie Moore. There's a base hit to start things off. Why don't you pinch hit Rube Foster right here? Yeah, right? Uh, should we bat for Mendez? Mendez is one for three in the ballgame. We, we can. Uh, no, who do we I think Jose Mendez has got a hit. You who you a... got next? You got a, this is a game about looking ahead. Uh, Rodriguez is on deck. Let's see what our, got, we let's have see what our options are. Every one are. of those guys in that lineup can catch. We got Edgar Washington on the bench. We got Tom Young on the bench. Uh, we got Portuando on the bench. And a bunch, I don't know who these Jim Unknowns are. I have no idea why they're showing up there. But we want to let Mendez bat, or do you want to? Uh... I do. All right, we're going to let Jose Mendez bat. I love Blue Washington, another movie actor. Was he? Oh, no, Mendez. Well, he didn't drive the double play, but he grounds out. Here's Rodriguez. There's a base hit. So the Monarchs not going quietly. Moore makes the turning, heads to third. So, oh, that was Mendez. He was on to the fielder's choice. So, first and third. Here's Arumas. You want your one shot at oh! it, Oh! Right? Man, base it into right field. It's now four to two. Rodriguez heads to third. 
No, he stopped at second. So the, the Monarchs make it an interesting. They got one run in, two on, one out, and Otto Ray, who's one with for a triple. Three. One for three with a triple. Scored the run back in the second or third inning. Here's the pitch. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Oh. Hurry. Oh, he, he was able to not ground into the double play, at least. And so Hurley McNair trying to keep this game alive against Lee Meadows. Here's the pitch. And that should do it. Yeah, that'll do uh, it. Hurley McNair grounds up. They had to shift on for him or something. Is that right? I don't maybe know. We should, you know, we should be outraged, and maybe we should start a movement. <laughs> right? <laughs> Give me a break. All right, so 4-2, your final. An interesting ending for the Monarchs as they put a couple on and, and made it interesting. Irish Musial with that two-run inside the park home run was pretty much the difference. Irish. Irish, got be, yeah. Got to be reaching for my Irish whiskey to this point. <laughs> And let's see what the attendance was. 1,241. I think they would have had more than that on hand. for. The... That's a lot of nickels. Yeah, I think they would have had more than more than that on hand, though. I don't know. No, uh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, some of those box scores that I was, or, that I was looking in the newspapers about were um, crowds of uh, 5, 6, 10,000 for some of these... Uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they, they had, uh, they did not have, uh, they were not lacking for fans to come and see these kinds of uh, games. I'm going to throw up real quick the uh, Negro National League so you can you can see where we are on that. And, and that was fun. That was fun. So the result was fairly close to being the same, right? Uh, no, it was one to zero in the actual result. It was one to zero. This one four to two. A little more exciting. A little bit more base hits. Yeah, Musial hit a home run out of Association Park. Which um, which Musial hit it? Um, the New York Yankee one. So Bob. Bob, yep. So Bob, and this, so in our game, Irish hit the uh, hit the inside the Parker to that deep part of Sportsman's Park. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you added another two hundred feet on each. <laughs> Um, right with Sportsman's Park. I mean, you made it a little bit bigger than Association Park in Kansas City. Now look, Bunny Brief hits 42 home runs in 1919, 20, whatever. It That's was. a year, yeah. Right, but he's playing at Association Park in Kansas City. Uh, it was a see, home uh, run hitters park. Yeah, I would have to see what the dimensions were there. It reminds me of um, there was a in when I I grew up in the uh, Northeast PA, north of Philadelphia, a little bit in, in Scranton, and there was a, a college league uh, there the Scranton Red Sox, where I guess back in the day, you know, that's why my dad became a Red Sox fan because they had uh, uh, many of the uh, greats that played for the Red Sox, like uh, sure. uh, even uh, Ted Williams and, uh, um, and others that came through Scranton on their way up to Boston. But uh, they played at this stadium called Shouts Stadium, which was uh, in, in Dunmore actually. But the, the left field uh, wall it was almost like Fenway Park. It was on the other side was a big warehouse, and so if you were a left-handed hitter, uh, you could you only needed to hit it. You need to hit it high, but you only needed to hit it like in Fenway, about 300 to 320 feet, just high. Right. But if you were a right-handed hitter, it was a cavern. <laughs> Right. I mean, Very nobody. City block. Oh my goodness! Because, yep. because like, I, I, I'm so I'm I'm bring that up because I'm picturing Association Park kind of in the same situation, right? You're you're uh, you're probably building it around what your terrain was. <laughs> and, yeah, well, I've been to Association Park's footprint, and it's um, they had a train track in the outfield. Um, let's see, I believe that would be cutting right center, right center field train track out there so there was some you know i'm gonna throw you back up on here first well so there was going. some uh definite uh you know fitting the ballpark into the footprint sure sure. yeah and i i get it i mean that's this was a different this was a different time period a different world you, you know in, in from today's baseball and and yeah you got to wrap your head around all of these little intricacies that but i, I hand her back to a op-ed piece that was in the sporting news um Something in a, in a paraphrase, but they um, they said that uh, if you increase batting averages, people would stop coming to the games. 
Um, they'd stop coming to the games because the games would get longer. Mm -hmm. A typical baseball game is about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half. Um, and they were, <laughs> they talked about the revolt that there would be if these guys really started batting, because if hitters were hitting, then the games would get longer and then no one could possibly stand to be able to go to the ballpark for that long. And so by today's <laughs> standards, you got to understand that was a part of the game. They were trying to hold it in, right? I they guess want, so. They, they really liked pitching and they really liked catching but they really weren't big fans of hitters because the game got longer and it was hard <laughs> to keep people's interest in that. That's and that's really no different than it is today. It is. You know, although as a kid, um, I never wanted to leave once I got there. No, of course. <laughs> I was, if I was at a game, whether it was the Scranton Red Sox or an American Legion game in Old Forge with my dad when I was a kid or going to a Phillies or Yankees game because we were that close where we could be in any of these places to go see a game within a couple hours and uh, I never wanted to leave I just thought it was uh, you know perfect place to be well it's so, time travel and yeah. that's um, and that's as close as you can get to it um, to have some sort of recall of the way it used to be um, nostalgia matters to people Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is indelible in each and every one of us. We all have our or baseball origin story, and um, that's something to uh, you know really cherish. I really appreciate everyone mm -hmm. who has been exposed to the game in terms of yep. how it touches them. Yeah, it really it it everybody. It's kind of a personal thing, right? And it has to do with smells, and it has to do with grandfathers, and it has to do with all sorts of things. Uh, yep. But the ballpark is a different place. Um, it's a sacred place to many people, uh, and it's what fuels the love of the game. That's right. Um, but I believe today it is an equal place, and I do believe today it is a place that where we can have um, reminders of the legacies of the people who we chose to forget in the past. Um, I think that's important, mm -hmm. and I think that what we're doing to try and yeah. uh, talk I, more about these players. Uh, sure, it's historical. It's history for sure. Um but it's history that hasn't been given a fair shake and we're still haven't gotten it yet. We still work on that and mm -hmm. have, have a chip on our shoulder. We want to advance the uh, careers and knowledge of people of what happened in our shared past. That's right. And I, I appreciate you and all the, all you guys that have been doing this, especially for it's so long. Some of you have been poking and poking and prying. Well, me. yeah, it was just before now, we were on the phone. Before we got on this morning, I was entering games. I mean, what you do is you get um, uh, games submitted by people, and I was processing uh, so that we can recall these things. I mean, that's what you need to be able to do. Uh, you need to be able to understand the different forms of information. One game has a box score. One game has just a complete readout of the game. Guy goes first, guy goes second, two outs, whatever. It's mm -hmm. just written out. Uh, you have to process all this information to, in order to get a glimpse uh, what, at what the big prize is, which is the great career and legacy of John Donaldson that we have the ability to restore. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't take, uh, he can't take the back seat anymore. Um, it's time for us to talk about who he was, the greatness of what he did. Um, and you'll narrate to find somebody who can knock uh, what John Donaldson's influence was on the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am while you're talking I am just throwing up a little bit of the 1920 season that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do in a week uh, so we can take a look at it but look at that Na Negro National League race and and I just want to just reiterate this as I have in the past I've taken a lot of poetic license here I've tried to make the players the teams the logos the stadiums as you know within the construct of the game uh, as close as possible but I've taken some liberties with adding the Eastern Colored League just to get more players into it because it had players on them like Cannonball Redding and Joe Williams sure. on the Brooklyn Royal Giants that would not be in the Negro National League. Uh, and they did have a loose affiliation with playing some games against the Negro National League, but uh, they didn't exist until 1923, I don't believe. But um, but then, um, you know, it's just so much fun to take a look at this, right? So you, you've got the Negro National League, you've got the Giants, St. Louis Giants. Yep. Dayton, which started out like 9-0. Uh, they're now 17 and 11, but they're tied for top with Chicago and the Detroit Stars and the Monarchs two back. Uh, yep. Havana struggling a bit. They're, they seem to be the doormat this year so far. So far, it's a long season. The other Cuban Stars, 
the Cuban Stars yeah. didn't have a home t- home field. No. Nope. Um, imagine every game in your whole life is on the road. On the road. And so um, that's, that's the the other liberty I've taken here is not just adding Eastern Color League. I've set this up as if it is a modern um, – it's a 140-game schedule I'm going to play, so everybody plays each other 20 times, and I believe 23 or 24 times in the Eastern Colored League, uh, just just to get that baseball feel that people are looking for. And what I think I'm going to do in, in talking to you and everybody else, uh, others about this, is maybe once I finish this season, we do a little barnstorming in the off season, and then for 1921, as the season flips in this to 21, I open it up and let these guys, you know, let Major League Baseball teams sign some of these guys and see what happens. <laughs> I think that'd be no, kind that's of fun. Right. It'd be kind of fun. Uh, and I do have projects like that 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 involve that, but not with this in depth of the Negro National League and, and these players. Uh, uh, more of what the game gives you with some modifications and I've done some things where they've integrated and it's interesting. We can talk about that another time. But anyway, so over in the Eastern colored league, we got uh, the backer up a game on the giants. Um, I just read an article stars. that I we had found that about the Eastern colored league. And it was from 1923, I think. And the, the it was talking about the Kansas city monarchs and one of the newspapers in Kansas city said, um, the Eastern Colored League is here to sign away all of our stars. Right. And and that we and they're all of these guys, and they mentioned John Donaldson, Hurley McNair, uh, and a couple other guys from the Kansas City Monarchs about how they just dead set refuse to allow them. They're happy where they are, and, the, and by all accounts, they were. Interesting. Uh, but there was all that player rating and all that stuff happened. And, you know, and that was probably, I'm sure – why a lot of these guys were okay with trying to set up this league because weren't they were trying to get that stability like that with uh, without having all this rating of everybody's rosters that tended to maybe sometimes go on uh, here and there. Uh, no, and no doubt about that. Yeah. But I, it was also, um, you know, for guys like John Donaldson to have a league was to take a pay cut. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's right, because then it would cut into his barnstorming, right? (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, the league wasn't something that he necessarily had to do. Um, And that's a a fact. Um, What he was able to do and what he was able to accomplish before that and after um, were relevatory in what, what, what it meant to be in the league. Now, I just think that the answer is when you start talking about did they really think this Negro National League was going to last 100 years? Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think they did. Probably not. Uh, I don't think there was anybody at the original meeting on February 13th of 1920 who was setting up the league in Kansas City who thought this thing was going to last very long at all. Uh, they right. certainly would be a part of that if it wanted to be, but I don't think there was a sense that um, you were going to start something that would last to be 70 years or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. 